Now Samuel was serving the Lord. He was a young boy, clothed in a linen priestly vest. His mother would make a small robe for him and take it to him every year when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife. And may the Lord replace the child of this woman that you gave back to the Lord. Then they would return home. And the Lord paid attention to Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the Lord's service. Eli was very old, but he heard everything his sons were doing to the Israelites and how they laid with the women who served at the meeting tent's entrance. Eli said to his sons, Why are you doing these terrible things that I'm hearing about from everybody? No, my sons, don't do this. The report I hear spreading among God's people isn't good. If someone sins against someone else, God can intercede. But if someone sins against the Lord, who will intercede then? But they wouldn't obey their father because the Lord wanted to kill them. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel kept growing up and was more and more liked by both the Lord and the people. The word of God for us, the people of God. I heard a story from a member of a church who had an older son and a younger daughter. The older son was off in college or about to head out to college. The younger daughter was elementary school age. And they came for Christmas, and you can imagine there were lots of gifts underneath the tree. And Christmas morning, the son opened up his present, and it was a very nice watch. And then he turned to his dad and said, Dad, I really like the watch. It's very nice, but I can't help but notice that that was the only gift with my name on it. And all these other gifts that are under the tree are for my younger sister. It just seems like there's an imbalance here. <laughs> Not to compare, but it just seems like there's something missing. And the dad sat down and, and said, well, son, if you'd like, I'm happy to sell that watch and replace it with a variety of toys and trinkets. You see, her gifts are much cheaper. And we could fill the tree with all of your gifts, and it would be wonderful, and you could have those to play with as you go to college. <laughs> and then he said, furthermore, I mean, if you really, really want, we could fill this room. I could withhold tuition, and we could really fill the room. And we could just make hundreds of gifts in here just for you, if that's what you'd rather have instead. And so the son looked down at his watch, nice watch, and he said, you know what? It really is a nice gift. And he moved on. <laughs> the question's ended. That day, you see, sometimes don't we do this? We compare our gifts with others. We compare with family, with friends, with neighbors, whoever it might be. And this is exactly what's happening in this passage here. It's what's happening with these three kids. You see, Eli has two sons. They are off in college to be priests. They're in seminary, but they're rather wild. They don't do a whole lot of things right. They are party animals. I will let you know this doesn't happen in seminary at all anymore. And this is not my experience, but this was the experience for Eli's two sons. And they get in trouble for it a little bit. They wreak havoc, and it's right in front of the shrine, right in front of the church. And then there's the younger boy, Samuel, elementary aged, just a kid fourth, fifth grade. He's being raised there. He was a gift from God to Hannah, and so Hannah dedicated him to service and to be raised as a priest, and that's why he's there living with Eli. And he's a very thoughtful boy. He listens to Eli. He follows what Eli says, what Eli asks. He seems to be doing good things. And that's really nice. 
particularly when the two older boys are not. And Eli seems to be a good teacher, at least a decent priest, in that moment, at least for now. And the comparison between Eli's sons and Samuel is stark. It is abundantly different, a world different. Every time that Eli's sons are mentioned, it is really negative. Every time that Samuel is mentioned, it is overwhelmingly positive. And scripture goes back and forth for four chapters, the very first four chapters of 1 Samuel. It is constant, this ebb and flow, this back and forth between the sons and Samuel. And one of the complaints against the two sons is that they set aside some of the meat that is offered for a sacrifice. When people come in to give their sacrifice, to make their sacrifice before the Lord, the practice at this time was that all of that meat would then be boiled. The priest could take a little bit out of that and eat after it's been sacrificed, after it's been boiled. Instead, Eli's sons, they cut off the choicest slice. They cut off the filet. They cut off the prime rib. And they set that aside, and then they boil the rest. They want to have a barbecue a little bit later. And Eli's the priest. You see, I realize it's the boys that are doing the action here, but they're doing it because they've been instructed to. They've been told, this is okay. As Eli is raising Samuel, and it seems like he's doing a good job, Eli is missing a significant piece. He doesn't instruct his own two kids. He doesn't continue their education into seminary. He doesn't instruct them of what is sinful and what isn't. And he, in fact, encourages this awful and sinful practice of withholding meat, withholding part of the sacrifice. He's the one that's been getting the prime rib, the filet mignon. He hasn't stopped it. He doesn't correct it. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't even call for their repentance, for their change of heart. He's the priest. It's his job. He doesn't do it. And that's what Eli has done for his sons, and it's rather unfortunate. Conversely, though, Hannah, as we read this morning, Hannah, who only sees her son once a year, she comes with a gift. She comes with a beautiful robe that she has made. It is difficult and expensive to travel, but she puts her all into it. She comes with her sacrifice each year. She comes to see her own son. She comes to give a gift. And she comes to worship. She does everything that she can for Samuel, even though she's far off, even though she isn't able to be there with him every single day. She loves her son, and from afar, she raises him as best as she can. And I'll tell you, this is becoming a problem for Eli, this stark difference. It's becoming a problem for Eli that he's not being the priest he's been called to be. He's not correcting and demanding repentance. He's not offering forgiveness through sacrifice and appropriate sacrifice. He's not doing any of that. You see, so much of the first four chapters go back and forth between Eli's sons and Samuel, between Eli and Samuel, until finally at the end of chapter four, the judgment does come. And it's rather harsh. And even still, at the end of chapter 4, it's Samuel who finds favor. It's Samuel who is still the young boy. It's Samuel who's still doing the right things. He seems to be raised well. It's so easy to go back and forth during this time of year. It's so easy to compare our lives to others. It's the end of the year. It's a nice time to reflect. 
a nice time to look back at what we've accomplished, what we've done, a nice time to look ahead at what is to come in 2022, but it's also a really easy time to see, well, my neighbor got that promotion. I got a mug for Christmas, they got a car. I got the PS4, they got the PS5, right? Whatever it might be, I don't know. It's so easy to compare at the end of the year or at Christmas. It's natural to reflect on how it all went. And I'll tell you, it's been 31 years since Christmas Vacation came out, but I'm still comparing myself. I'm still comparing myself to the dad who... 31 years ago, got a Christmas bonus large enough to put in a big pool and fly down his family to dedicate it. It's amazing how we can do that, how so easy it is, how it's a race to see who's the best, to keep up with the Joneses, to make sure we are doing better than our siblings or friends or neighbors or whatever else. And this is exactly what Eli and his sons are doing. They were priests. They were the ones that offered the sacrifices. They were the ones that were chosen by God. They were the ones that were doing everything they were supposed to be doing. At least that was the the thought from the Israelites. They were the ones that were reading God's word and being able to share it. Isn't it only right that they get to take the first cut? Isn't it only right that they get to skim a little off the top? Isn't it only right that they should be able to look down on everybody else and say, yeah, you're okay, but I'm better. I'm the one that's offering the sacrifice. I'm the one that's doing the work. I'm the one that's giving you God's forgiveness. That's what Eli's sons and Eli are doing, and it is painful. Meanwhile, Samuel is the one born after years of infertility. Samuel is the one that's born into poverty and struggle. Samuel is the one born and dedicated into the service of the Lord immediately. Samuel is the one who's not able to be raised by his mother and father, and instead has to be raised by an elderly Eli. Samuel's the one that's not raised in a home, but rather at a shrine. It's amazing to think, it is amazing to me to think that Samuel, born into all of that, at the end of this passage we read, he still finds favor with the Lord and with people. It's him, not Eli, not the sons. It's Samuel that is the one that's growing in his faith, that's growing with the people around him, that's growing in the Lord. It's amazing to think that there's a well-trained priest who has presided over the sacrifices for decades, who the people of Israel know so incredibly well and who the people of Israel have been coming to every year. And yet, by the end of this passage, at the end of what we read today, the people of Israel are more excited to see the boy Samuel. And not because he's a child and it's exciting to see children. I understand that. They're excited to see Samuel because he is finding favor with the Lord and with the people. He's the one that's growing. He's the one that's sharing wisdom. He's the one that's doing what is obviously what God has called him to do. It's clear to the nation of Israel as they come and as they make sacrifices that it's Samuel who's truly been called now. They come for the wise child who seems to be able to answer their very difficult questions, who can speak hope into their trials and to their problems that they have. They don't come for Eli anymore. And it reminds me of the passage that we heard even earlier this morning, because it includes a similar phrase. 
We've read the story about the young boy Jesus. He's 12 years old. He's left behind in Jerusalem for, 12, for three days. He's found by his parents in the temple where people go to make sacrifices, to worship, to seek the Lord's wisdom, and guidance from priests. And Jesus is asking questions and answering questions. He's having conversation with the people there in the temple. It's evident that he is very wise. It's evident that he's very knowledgeable. It's also evident that he's a 12-year-old. And he asks, feed me when he's hungry. He asks for a place to sleep when he gets tired. Because he's not with mom and dad for three days. Jesus is surrounded by priests and other guests. People have gathered to see him. And they've come into this classroom to witness this 12-year-old boy and to share with him this experience, this moment. And at the end of that passage, we read, again, that very familiar phrase, Jesus grew in favor with God and with people just like the prophet Samuel. Comparing ourselves to others with envy is a rather dangerous thing. It's never a good idea. Envy and greed, as it turns out, is a really, really serious sin, and it destroys lives often. It seems to me that it's part of the reason why the stories of Samuel and Eli are juxtaposed the way they are, why they are written the way they are. It's constantly back and forth rather than the story of Eli and his sons, then the story of Samuel. They're intertwined. They're shown together because this comparison that Eli's sons in particular are participating in is dangerous. It's painful. and It leads to judgment. They go back and forth to show us Show us the person that looks like they're doing really well. Eli is actually the one that's just a step away, a chapter away from deep, deep judgment. Samuel continues to grow in favor with the Lord and with people. Christ continues to grow in favor with the Lord and with people. And that's our example. Even Christ... Even God with us, the Messiah, the Savior, even he is growing in favor with God and with people. There is still room to grow. And if Christ at 12 can grow, so can we this Christmas season. It's absolutely our example. Growing in favor with God and with people could look like a great many things as we continue to grow in our faith, could look like a great many things as we continue to pursue sanctification, as we continue to pursue God's grace in our lives and our growing faith. But for Christ and Samuel, at least in these two passages, I think there's two big things that growing in favor means. First, it meant spending a lot of time in a place of worship. It means spending a lot of time worshiping our God. This is something that Samuel obviously does. He lives there. Perhaps he's cheating as he can to be there. But it means we need to come to church. It means we need to worship our Savior because when we miss, when we lack that in our lives, we're no longer growing. Something is absent. Christ, of course, spends three days in the temple, means coming to church, it means spending our time where God is, where the people of God are, and rather than just worshiping when it's convenient or easy. And then the second thing they do is Samuel and Christ meet a lot of people. It's difficult to grow in favor with people if you're not meeting them, if you're not there with them you don't know the people that are there. And I openly admit, I am an introvert. This is sometimes really, really difficult and painful for me. But if my 12-year-old Savior can do it, 
if when he gets left behind and he's sitting alone in the temple and people are coming up and he's sharing good news with them, I can do it. If fourth grade Samuel can sit at the shrine as people come in from miles and miles around to make sacrifices, if he can meet people and share good news with them and offer hope to them and grow in favor with them, I can do it too. If we can ask questions when we're confused, if we can ask questions and answer others, right, just like Christ and Samuel does, we can do that too. And it's particularly amazing for me with Christ as he's a 12-year-old boy here in a temple where there's a lot of people who know exactly what they're doing in the temple, know exactly that this is what they're charged to take care of, whose job it is to take care of it even. But for Christ, it feels a little bit different. He even says, I'm hosting. Right, when, when Mary comes in, why are you here? Don't you know I should be here? I'm in my father's house. For Christ, as he's there in the temple, he's hosting. These guests, these priests, these friends that are coming in that he doesn't know, or that he shouldn't know, perhaps, he greets them because this is his home, this is his place of worship, and this is where his father is. And he wants to welcome everybody into that love. He's the one greeting the guests into his home. And so instead of envy or greed, Christ offers hospitality. Do we do the same in our church? Instead of sin, Christ offers grace and welcoming. Growing in favor with God and with people. That's what Christ does. And church, this should never stop. We must continue to grow in favor, continue to worship, and continue to offer the hospitality to the people that we meet. And it's at this point I want to shift back to something that we saw at the beginning because this should never end. The growth doesn't end. You see, the joy of Christmas is the incarnation. God became flesh. He experiences what we experience, like growth and favor, like continuing in that growth and favor. But in our passage this morning, Eli had stopped growing. Eli's sons had stopped growing. Eli yells at his sons for being sinful. He warns them that he can't forgive their sins says, who's going to do it? I can't. He chastises his sons, but offers no solution, offers no forgiveness, offers no pardon, offers no sacrifice, offers no prayer or repentance, offers no fight to say, I don't know how, but I'm going to pray for you anyway. I am going to intercede because as a priest, that's what I can do. And hopefully God will hear. And hopefully God will offer mercy and forgiveness because we know God is a loving and merciful God. Eli does none of that. He is a priest and he has given up on his calling. He has given up on what he is supposed to do. He does not do his job and he has given up on his sons. That is harsh, but he doesn't do it. And it's really, really painful for me to say this, but Samuel loses favor too. Because I really love Samuel. But as Samuel gets older, he's gonna lose favor too. He runs into almost the exact same issues that Eli does. His sons do almost the exact same things. Samuel has failed. He stopped growing in favor with the Lord and with people as he gets older. And Samuel similarly doesn't offer forgiveness, doesn't offer pardon, doesn't intercede 
with prayer on behalf of his own kids and on behalf of the people in his community. Samuel stopped growing in favor with the Lord and with people. Christ, though, is the difference. Christ breaks that routine. Christ never stops. And he still has them. Christ does offer forgiveness even in the most difficult times, even in the most challenging times, and even in the hardest of sins. Christ continues to be there for us because God is with us, because Christ is our king, because Christ is our holy and high priest who will make that intercession for us. He does pour out grace. The incarnation means that we are no longer relying on the words of the prophets as good as they are sometimes. It means that we're no longer relying on the grace of the priests of old as wonderful as that was sometimes. It means that we are relying on the almighty and all-saving grace of our Savior. We're instead relying on the living word of Jesus, now, tomorrow, and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.